while we do that, I'll introduce myself. My name is Jay Esposito, and I'm the Assistant Dean for Enrollment Management here at Drexel University's Thomas R. Klein School of Law. And it's a great pleasure to be here with you this evening. I can see a number of you are coming in. So we're going to jump in and get started. Um, please feel free at any time to use the chat function to add in your question. We got a ton of questions from you as you were registering for tonight's session. Um, so what I'm going to do to get us started, we're going to just brush through a pretty quick presentation about the school, just to kind of give you an idea of who we are, what differentiates us from some of our peers, things like that, right? So we'll talk about the school, um, but we're going to keep that pretty brief because I really want to drill down, focus on our application components and really get the opportunity to talk about what is the application, what's required, what are all the pieces of it, um, and we're going to save all of your questions for the end, and you're welcome, like I said, to please put your questions into the chat as they come up. I am joined this evening by my colleague, Jacqueline Marsh. Jacqueline, do you want to jump on real fast and just introduce yourself? For sure. I'm Jacqueline Marsh. I'm the assistant director um, in the Client Admissions Office, and I, I know I have chatted with a number of you um, either on the phone or, um, or through email, so it's nice to see you all here tonight. Yes, indeed. So we'll get started. We'll just jump right in and we'll talk about our school. So first and foremost, who are we, right? We are, as I said at the top of our call, Drexel Thomas R. Klein School of Law. What sets us apart? What are we known for? I would say, number one, that first bullet there, you see that we're known for our location. We're located in Philadelphia. We are in the heart of University City, which is a huge neighborhood of scholars, right? So you have Drexel University closely lined up right next to University of Pennsylvania. So this quite literally means that you're surrounded by scholars from every imaginable field, every area of study, but also from across the globe, right? Not just here in the United States, but internationally, both on Drexel's campus and on Penn's campuses. You are closely located to the Philadelphia International Airport. So for anybody that's looking at us from outside of the region, um, it's very easy to get in and out of Philly. There's also 30th Street train station just a few blocks from our campus. So anybody that's using any of the regional rails or Amtrak to be able to get in and out of Philadelphia, you can quite literally walk to and from the train station from the law school. Easy access to Washington, D.C., New York City, other major cities right here in the area. And for those that may not know this, Philadelphia is headquarters for some of the largest law firms in the United States, as well as just a ton of Fortune 500 companies. We've got universities, we've got hospitals, we have federal, state, local, municipal courts. Why is this important? It basically means that our students are often within very, very close proximity, walking distance in many cases, to their co-ops. And we're going to talk about co-op in just a moment. What else are we known for? We're known for our age. The inaugural class at the Drexel Thomas R. Klein School of Law began in August of 2006. Why does that matter? Um, despite being on the law school landscape for only 17 years, we really consider ourselves to be quite new and quite innovative. We really try, I think, very hard to be nimble we try to be quick to adapt or make changes as they're needed. Um, I think this is really important and it's something that speaks very closely to our identity. We're trying always to improve and to grow. And I think that's evidenced by our steep upward climb in the rankings over the years. What else are we known for? We're known for experiential learning. Experiential learning, you're gonna hear this come up over and over again whenever you're talking to anybody um, at Drexel Klein School of Law. What does it mean? It basically means taking what you're learning in the classroom and putting that immediately to use in your job, in your co-op, in your internship. We're going to drill down on that in just a moment. And last but not least, I think we're really known for our tightly knit community. We have roughly 400, anywhere usually averaging from 400 to 450 students. That means each incoming class, and that is our summer and fall classes combined, usually make up about 150 to 160 total new students per year. So that's really small, right? 
it allows for a lot of individualized attention, a lot of individualized counseling for jobs, for careers, for bar success, all of those things, course registration, right? The faculty and the staff and the students who are at Drexel Klein School of Law really seem to want to lift one another up. We're all rooting for each other's success. And I think that that's evident as you get to know those of us on the staff, but also our students. And we really encourage you to get to hear more about that warm and collegial community from our students. We give lots of opportunity for you to connect with them. We're gonna share with you throughout this call ways that you can connect with our current students. So if being a part of a relatively small, relatively warm and collegial community speaks to you at all, then I think you know that you're in the right place when you're looking at our law school. Very quickly, I want to look at some of our programs and we're not gonna spend much time on this I wanted to emphasize, if you're looking on the left-hand side of the screen, right, you can see all of our JD options. I really just wanted to shout out that we have three different ways of entering into the JD. So you can apply for the traditional three-year JD program, which begins in the fall. You can join, we have an accelerated two-year program, and the two-year program is very, very popular. It's relatively small. I'd say we're on average bringing in about 20 students into that program per year. The two-year program is the same exact curriculum, same faculty, same experiences, experiential learning, all of those things that you're going to be getting through the three-year program, but you're doing it on an accelerated timeline. And in fact, we're going to be hosting on November 9th a webinar very specifically looking at the accelerated two-year and also our three-year summer start option. The three-year summer start option is a way for you to stretch out your 1L year so that instead of completing your 1L year in two semesters, you're completing it over three semesters. So it really gives you the opportunity to kind of take that coursework and instead of bundling it up in those two semesters, you're really getting to stretch it out and take a little bit lesser course load in that first year. So the students that do that, really find that they have the advantage there, that, that they're able to devote more time and, and effort and energy into their coursework by stretching them out. So again, November 9th, we're gonna be talking about those programs. If you're at all interested, please sign up for that webinar. Our graduate programs to the middle and to the right of the screen, these are all conducted online. So these are not uh, in-person programs that you would apply to through our admissions office to come to Philadelphia. Those would just be those JD programs that are on the left-hand side of the screen. And that's really what we're going to be focusing on this evening are our JD programs. All right, so we've talked a bit about experiential learning. I want to just get into some of these opportunities so that you have an understanding while we're talking throughout this call about co-op, about clinic, about the pro bono experiences. Again, we want you to have every opportunity to take what you're learning in the classroom and put it immediately to use in your job, in your co-op, in your internship. So how does that work, right? What is co-op? Co-op is very similar to a standard externship where you're working in an actual organization, but through co-op, you're allowed to, for a full semester or an academic year-long opportunity where you're actually earning significant course credit. And that course credit can range anywhere from six to 10 credits that are counting towards your JD degree. We have more than 200 co-op partners, and those are across the globe. They're here in the Philadelphia region, they're across the nation, and they're international. They are anything from a law firm to a corporate office. We have government agency co-op partners, we have courts, we have judges' chambers, um, there's co-op in public interest law, anything you can imagine. And in fact, there are students who identify organizations that are not already partners, and we're able to help see if we can make that uh, organization partner through the co-op program. Students, like I said before, go local, they go out of state, they go abroad. If you're somebody, for example, that comes from a particular region of the country that knows, hey, I want to go back to Florida, I want to go back to Seattle, I want to go back to Nevada, wherever it might be, right? You can do your co-op there. And we can, basically, we're going to work with each and every person to kind of individualize this experience for you. 
and you can do up to two co-ops while you're in the program. So that's just a little tiny bit about co-op. Clinics are a bit different. Clinics really offer you an opportunity to kind of do a deeper dive into a specific area of interest. So for example, you can argue cases in family court, you can argue cases in immigration court, the US Court of Appeals. You're gonna work one-on-one -on -one with our faculty and also with clients, so you're getting a lot of one-on-one -on -one experience. There's also a clinic that focuses just on folks that live here in West Philadelphia um, that requires some legal assistance. So clinics offer another way for you to get some face time with clients while you're a student. Pro bono hours, all students in our program are gonna be required to at least complete a minimum, minimum of 50 hours pro bono. And many students go way over the 50 hour requirement. We at the Klein School of Law are deeply committed to making legal services more accessible to underserved communities in particular. And our students routinely decide that once they start that pro bono uh, experience, they find it to be so beneficial to them, they stay in it. And many of them, like I said, go well over 100 hours in pro bono. So you have that option as well. So the theme here for our experiential education opportunities is that it's very hands-on, right? You're going to be taking what you're learning in the classroom, and you're going to be applying it in real time while you're a student. Here are just a few other co-curriculars, and I'm not going to drill down deep into any one of these. I just wanted to highlight them so that if you see or hear anything about these that really sparks your interest, these are excellent opportunities for you to speak one-on-one -on -one with our current students and ask them about law review, about moot court. Law review, for any of you who may not be familiar, it really focuses around high quality scholarship focused on meaningful legal issues and it's completely student run. So it's a student run journal, they put out one every year. Um, it's very, very special. It's something that many law schools offer. Um, so you can check out ours and, and hear more about it from some of our current students. Within moot court, you're given the opportunity to sharpen both your written and oral advocacy skills, super important, through participation in competition. You might be before hypothetical appellate courts. Um, you might travel around the country. There's a lot of opportunity within moot court. Our trial team, many of you know this already, but our trial team has won four national championships and actually ranked in the top 10 in trial competition performance rankings. So we are, uh, school that is very well known for trial team, and we have lots of prospective students out there that are interested in trial team. You also have alternative dispute resolution, um, where you might be doing things like client counseling, you might do negotiation, mediation, and then last but not least, we have over 20 student organizations um, who host charity fundraisers. They bring in notable guest speakers. They offer various affinity and identity groups. It's really a great way, I think, for students to get involved outside of the classroom with students who are like-minded or interested in things that they're interested in. So just a couple of co-curricular activities here. And again, like I said, jot any of these down if you're interested in, punch them into your phone so that you can ask some of our current students about them. Last but not least, before we hop into our admissions component. I just wanted to give you a, a kind of bird's eye view of our entering class profile for 2023. So this is just a super quick glance. This was our most recent class. You can see we brought in a class of 146 students. Our median LSAT score was a 159. Our median GPA was a 3.7. For our gender breakdown, this is about average. I, but this year we had a few more female identified students than in past cycles. Our most recent, I would say three cycles, averaged about 58% female identified students. Um, in terms of our students of color, over the last several years, we averaged around 33%. So we were happy to see that we were slightly above average this year at 36%. And our LGBTQIA population has averaged roughly 17% over the last several years and then our average age and age range. That I would say is pretty typical. Usually our average age lands somewhere right around 24 and the range you can see goes from 20 to 50 in this most recent class. So again, brushing through this very, very quickly, but just trying to give you a sense before we hop into these uh, admissions components of who we are as a school. 
All right. So the moment that you've all been waiting for, right? We're going to go through piece by piece. We're going to talk about each component of the application. Again, I saw some folks uh, writing in questions. You can send them directly to Jacqueline or myself. You can ask them to the larger group, whatever you're most comfortable with. And I got a slew of questions through your registration sheet. So I'm saving all of those for the end. We're going to go through them all one by one. But hopefully, as I talk about some of these components, we're going to answer questions that you weren't even sure that you had. So starting with the complete application, right? All applicants are going to apply through the Law School Admissions Council or LSAC. We are going to provide you with a series of links. We'll toss those into the chat. But lsac.org is where you're going to go to start your law school admissions application. And basically, for those of you who might have used something like the Common App when you were an undergraduate student, LSAC is similarly designed, where you're going to be submitting your materials to them as kind of a centralized unit. And then once all of they, you know, they've collected all of your materials together, you're going to be able to apply to different schools, and LSAC will share those materials with us. So that's important to know. Um, and we'll also put into the chat our how to apply page so that you know how to get back to this specific list of requirements and a very intricate breakdown of each item. So what makes up a completed application? There are several items on this list that are required and there are several items that are optional. And we're gonna go through each option one by one. Um, but the items that are required are your personal statement, your resume, your disclosures, and we'll get into what a disclosure is in just a moment. You're also required to submit what says there the Credential Assembly Service, or CAS. The CAS report is basically pulling together several items that are required for your application. So all of the transcripts that you have for any college-level coursework that you've completed, either undergraduate or at the graduate level, your letters of recommendation, your standardized test scores, right? All of those items are gonna go together in what LSAC refers to as the credential assembly service. And again, we're gonna break down all of these items in just a second. But your CAS will come through along with the rest of those required items, your personal statement, your resume, your disclosures to complete your application. Let's go one by one down each of these items so that we can drill down on them and give you a better sense of what they are. The personal statement. So everybody is required to write a personal statement. This year's personal statement is asking you, quote, explain why you want to attend the Drexel University Klein School of Law and become a lawyer. Feel free to identify any relationships, experiences, or personal ethical commitments that led you to this decision. It should be two pages double space, end quote. This is posted on our website, so it's easy to refer back to. Um, it's also when you log into lsac.org and go to our school's application page, you're going to find it there as well. So what are some things to be mindful of when you're thinking about the personal statement? I would say the most important piece, and, and mind you, any kind of advice that I'm offering, this is very much my thoughts, right? I think if you ask different folks from different admissions offices, they're all gonna give you different pieces of advice. So I would strongly encourage you to ask these types of questions of other folks that work in law, law admissions specifically. But with our application, when I'm reading applications and I'm looking at the personal statement, the personal statement is the place where you are getting to speak with me and getting to speak with other people directly who are reading your application and trying to review you through that lens of whether or not you would not only be a great fit for law school, but that you can complete law school and be successful in law school, right? So we really want you in the personal statement to tell us your story. The personal statement is your only opportunity, like I said, where you're speaking directly to the people reviewing your application. So tell us, like, what is your why? Why are you applying to law school? What brought you to law school? Was it, when you look back at the prompt, was it a very specific relationship or relationships in your life that led you to this decision or an experience or a personal ethical commitment? What is it? What was your why? What is it that brought you to law school? And I think it's really important for you to speak in your voice. 
that doesn't mean you want to make it informal. You don't want to make it like a text message, right? This is still an academic piece of writing. But you want to speak in your voice. We want to hear from you directly what brought you to law school and why you want to pursue this degree and this profession. I cannot stress enough how important it is for you to proofread your essay and have it proofread by others. And I say this, uh, I, I can't emphasize it enough. There are so many students who write some pretty beautiful personal statements that are full of very, very basic spelling and grammatical errors that if it, it makes me think if someone had just reviewed this, right, if you had just been able to hand it off to a friend, a mentor, somebody that you trust who can really kind of just take a look at it and give you a quick proofread on it, make sure you're able to do that before you click submit on the application. You also really want to try to give it to someone who you trust who can give you some good critical feedback, right? And anybody who you're asking to read your personal statement, I think it's important to provide them with the prompt so that you can ask someone who is objective, who is not you, does my personal statement answer the prompt, right? And of course, you're being very specifically given some instruction there on the length of your personal statement. It's staying in the prompt that it should be two pages double space. I would strongly advise trying to stick as closely to that as possible. There are some folks that can write a much shorter personal statement that is both impactful, that speaks in their voice, that answers the prompt, and that doesn't include major errors, but I would say that's much more rare. I would say most people are gonna hit at least that page and a half to two pages, and that they actually needed that space to be able to tell their story and be able to tell us who they are. Um, so I would say stick as close to the two pages as possible. You don't wanna go too crazy over that two page limit, because keep in mind, we're also reading your, your optional essay, and you've got that optional essay to be able to show off more about your personality, more about your writing skills, more about your ability to make it and be successful through law school. So anything that doesn't fit in that two pages for the personal statement, see if it's something that would fit into the optional essay. Last but not least, with regard to your personal statement, I would always say try to make it as specific to our school as possible. There are a lot of applicants out there that when they're writing their personal statement, they are going to make it one statement that they're going to send to a bunch of different schools. And I will simply say it's very, very obvious when we're reading a personal statement that is kind of blanket being used for all of your law schools that you're applying to. It's not necessarily that that's bad. I would say that because we are so community minded, specifically at Drexel Klein School of Law, and because we have such a huge applicant pool of students that are really, really eager to be a part of our community, I think it's really helpful for us to know that you've done your homework, that you have visited us, that you maybe have come for a tour or come for a class visit. Maybe you did one of our virtual JD information sessions where you're Zooming one-on-one -on -one with the current student and asking them your question. It's really, really helpful for us to know that you've done your homework and that you have held us up against our peers and against other law schools around the country and have decided this place is where I really want to practice or study law rather. This is where I want to be as a law school student. Um, so get that in there, show it to us, right? I think that's really important. Anything I might have missed, Jacqueline, on the personal statement? I see you saying no. No, I think that that's, yeah, I think you've covered most of it. Um, I mean, you know, just to reiterate what Jay said, I think, you know, at, at, I'm always telling applicants at the point of your application, while you can, for sure, you can retake the LSAT if you want, but but your your numbers are what they are. So you submit your application and that's what, you know, your numbers are what they are. Well, but the piece of your application that you can really, really let us know about you is your personal statement and the additional addendum. So, so that's just, you know, th those are really the features that we are, we are reading every single personal statement, every single addendum that comes in. We, you know, we really want to get to know you and that's really the way to do it. So, so use it to your advantage. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I saw just here in my notes to self, I put please do not use the wrong school name. You would be very surprised by how many students do that. 
It is certainly not a complete deal breaker, but it maybe doesn't look so great when we're trying to think through, you know, especially if you're going to school to be a lawyer. You want to be showing that you uh, pay very close and careful attention to detail, right? So try to make sure you look through and correct if you accidentally use the wrong school name. Moving on next to our optional essays. So you have two optional essays in our application for this year, and I'm going to read them to you so you can kind of just get a sense of what they are. Optional essay number one, describe any personal successes or challenges or barriers that you overcame, demonstrating that you have the determination, motivation, and or grit to be successful in law school and as a lawyer. We just created this this year. I think one of the things that we frequently are up against when we're kind of looking back at our classes that we've brought in and seeing who was able to make it through law school and who was able to pass the bar. One of the themes that comes up all the time is this idea that law school is really hard, right? It's really challenging. And even those of us in admission sometimes forget to stress this because we're so focused on making sure that you're finding the best fit law school, right? We, we think so much about the admissions process that we kind of forget about what comes next. Law school is really hard. Even our top students, and I would say this probably is true for most law schools around the country, even our top students are going to come in and they're going to struggle because it's just different from undergraduate, right? It's just different from any other graduate school experience out there in the country, in the world. So knowing that it's hard, we're giving you this optional essay to tell us that you have actually really thought this through and that you know that law school is the right path for you and that you are going to be successful in law school, that you have the resilience to be successful in law school, that maybe you've overcome insurmountable odds or major challenges that were thrown at you, whether it was throughout your entire lifetime or one very specific moment in your lifetime, whatever that thing is, tell us about it. We want to be able to see that you are resilient and that you are somebody who can kind of see a challenge and tackle it and get past it, whatever that means for you, right? So this optional essay is really giving you the opportunity to tell us what that thing is. Uh, but also remember, right, you've got your personal statement. So whenever you have these optional essays, this is just an additional opportunity for you to be able to speak directly to those people reading your application. So take that option. I would do one of the two of these optional essays if I were applying, just because I think I would want to take advantage of that, showing off my writing skills, showing off my personality through these essays. So that's optional essay number one. Optional essay number two quote unquote, what do you care about? That's it. It is giving you the opportunity to really be able to say whatever it might be. If it's one specific uh, topic that you're really passionate about, if it's a something that you've been passionate about for many, many years, right? It can honestly be anything that you would like to discuss with us. It's simply asking you, what do you care about? And so far, we've gotten some really great uh, responses to that essay question. It's relatively new for this year. Um, so again, take advantage of having one of those two options because it's, like I said, your way of being able to speak directly to us, but also show off those writing skills. So any questions you have about the personal statement or the optional essays, please get those into the chat and we'll be sure to cover those. But for the moment, I'm gonna move on now to our resume. What do we like to see? This is the question we get all the time with regard to the essay. What is it, or I'm sorry, the resume. What, what do we want you to include and what do we not want you to include? Me personally, I like to see everything. I don't typically see much on a resume that in my mind I feel like should not have been included. I would say definitely should tell us your, your undergraduate school, your GPA, your major, the dates that you attended school, right? We want to get some sense of your full educational background. And especially if you attended more than one school, give us those schools so we can see them in order, right? Give us an idea of where you've been. Tell us about the work that you've done, the internships that you've done. 
did you do any sort of co-op or internship or externship when you were an undergraduate or graduate school? Did you have any volunteer work, any volunteer hours that you want to share? Get all of those onto your resume. Did you work part-time jobs in between semesters or did you work while you were an undergrad or while you were in graduate school? Did you work any other times in your life? Get those onto the resume. Do you have specific skills that you've acquired over time? Do you have any professional organizations that you belong to? Um, when you were in school, did you belong to things like the key club or the speech and debate or mock trial, anything like that that is very, very relevant to law school? I would say absolutely get those in there as well. Did you have extracurriculars? Were you an athlete, right? Did you have awards? Do you have honors? What types of things did you acquire over these last several years? Get all of that in there. Are there any relevant courses? Maybe you were a pre-med major, or maybe you did a major kind of outside of the humanities, the arts, the sciences, that you really want to highlight, right? You can absolutely toss in those classes that are super relevant to law school. If you want to highlight those in the resume, I'd say go for it. Are you proficient in any specific languages? Absolutely give us that information, get that into your resume as well. If you're not sure, I would say if you have access to either like a career strategy team at your undergrad that maybe even if you've been out for a couple of years, if you can check back in with them, they'll almost always be happy to go through a resume for you and just take a look at it to better understand or, or to give you some very specific advice on how things look, right? Um, and if you're not sure, you can always reach out to the admissions office, ask us, we're happy to help. We can at least point you in the right direction if you have specific questions about your resume. Next on the list, we have the LSAT or the GRE. So either of the two are going to be required, right? You have to submit one or the other when you're submitting your application. Both are going to be submitted through LSAC. The LSAT if you've taken it, it's going to be included in your application. So you will be considered an LSAT applicant. So just keep that in mind. If you are someone that is preferring to try to take the GRE, you don't wanna take both the GRE and the LSAT because the LSAT will show up on your CAS report. So we are going to see your LSAT score. Um, so you would not want to take both. If you're going to do the GRE, I would say you definitely just want to do the GRE. We only require one GRE score, um, but you can send in as many as you'd like if you've taken it more than once. Any additional questions about the standardized test score, please get those into the chat because we didn't really get a lot of questions about that in the uh, questions that were submitted beforehand. Your undergraduate transcript your professional school transcripts, any schools that you've taken at the college level, you absolutely want to get those into LSAC so that we can make sure that they go through that uh, service. They're going to make sure that everything is accurate, that everything we need is on there. So it's really, really helpful. Get those submitted through LSAC. Um, and if you did attend multiple schools, you do want to attend or uh, submit rather your transcripts from all of those schools. So please don't forget that. Um, if you have questions about the transcript, again, get those into the chat. Next on our list, we've got letters of recommendation. We get tons and tons of questions about letters of recommendation. I won't drill down too hard on this since we didn't get a lot of questions from you all about letters of recommendation in your registration form when you sign up for this session. Um, but we require two letters and we can accept up to four letters. I would say when you're thinking about who should write your letter of recommendation, if you have a close academic that you worked with while you were an undergraduate or a graduate student, I think it's always super helpful to hear from a professor who taught one of your classes, um, who can speak to tons of skill sets about you that a professional won't necessarily be able to speak to, right? So an academic reference is usually going to tell us things about your writing skills, about your uh, being able to speak up in class and what you add to the class discussion, your research skills, your ability to work on a team, things like this. Whereas a professional, um, they might be talking very specifically about you as a member of your professional organization, right? 
both very helpful, but both very different. So where possible, I would say get one or the other, a professional and an academic. Um, whereas if you do not still have close ties to an academic reference, or if you, for example, uh, had very, very large classes, so you didn't work closely one-on-one -on -one with an academic while you were an undergrad, it's not necessarily then helpful to get that academic reference. Because believe me when I say, and you'll hear this from a lot of folks that read applications, it is not helpful when we get references from an academic who doesn't really know you, right? Or a professional who you didn't work very closely with. It's gonna read that way when you're reading your application. It's not gonna give us a lot of great detailed information about you. So I'll keep going down the list of items here, um, but get those questions in the chat if you have any about your letters of recommendation. Last on the list here are disclosures. Disclosures are very specific to law school. So they're gonna ask you in the law school application very direct questions about your academics, if you've ever been suspended or expelled or withdrawn from a college or a university. It's gonna ask you all of these things um, that you have to respond yes or no to. It's gonna ask you about military disclosures, if you've ever been court-martialed. It's gonna ask you legal disclosure if you've ever been convicted of or pleaded guilty to a crime. All of those disclosures are inside your application and if you say yes to any of them, you're going to be required to then uh, fill out the disclosure section of the application. So anybody that has questions about that, let me know. And again, I don't wanna rush through any one of these. I wanna make sure we get to all the questions that you all submitted. Okay, I'm going to so, chime in yeah, just because of any questions that are coming in that are that I feel like might be important to answer to the group. Um, yeah. I'll you chime in or I'll ping you to um to do the same. But um, someone had wrote in asking, you know, the length of the resume. Um, mm -hmm. that some schools um might ask separately for a scholarship or honors or extracurriculars list. Um, okay. mm -hmm. so if we want to speak to that a little bit, um, yeah, sure. I would say I don't personally have a preference. I would say, I think once it hits past two pages, it's probably too long. Like, I don't think we need that much detail. Um, but really it's all about quality. Like if there's really quality stuff on your resume, it's okay if it's gonna be two or three or four pages. Some students will submit cu curriculum vitae or CV, right? Mm -hmm. CVs tend to be much longer than resumes. If you already have a CV, that's great. You can submit that, that's perfectly fine. Um, but I would say, you know, short and sweet, the better. Yeah. Think about the quality as opposed to the length when you're asking, should I put this or should I not put this? And if you're not sure, you can always reach out to us and ask, and we can give you some advice. Um, and, and then another question that came in is just about submitting anything additional um, if you didn't submit it with your application. And, you know, we are always happy to take um, an addendum or, you know, if, if you submitted an app your application, then you know you remember that you had wanted to write something, you know, an additional essay or uh, a GPA addendum, or you omitted something that you meant to submit. You can email that in at the end of this. Um, at the end of the slide, you'll see our email address. I'll also pop it in the chat. Um, but you can email us at any time to our law admissions email address, um, and we will get that information into your file. So always yeah. welcome to, to submit additional info to us. That's exactly right. And regarding those addendums, we get a ton of questions about these. So I just wanted to give you a few quick notes on the addendum. For some people, let's say if they're drafting their personal statement and their optional essay, right, and they feel like they've done a stellar job on those and they don't want to change them up, but maybe their uh, personal statement or their addendum doesn't include a lot about why they want to come to Drexel Klein School of Law specifically, you can absolutely do a written addendum on why Drexel Klein School of Law. That's perfectly fine. Some students do that. And uh, as long as that information is included somewhere, I would say throw it in the addendum. That's a great place to put it. Some people like to tell us about let's say major gaps in their resume or major gaps in their transcript. Some people tell us about why they chose the recommenders that they chose or why they didn't choose a recommender. So for example, if you have a uh, close, you know, a manager that you're working very closely with for several years, but that manager doesn't know that you're applying to law school. So you don't wanna ask them for the letter of recommendation. 
that's always helpful to throw into an addendum. Um, I've heard from students who one or two said, you know what, I'm working with this very kind of uh, intense, we'll say, thesis advisor or professor who I don't know if they're going to write me a great letter of recommendation, then I would say go to someone else who you think can write you a good letter. And if you want to put that in an addendum, that's perfectly fine. If you're not sure and you just want to give us information that isn't otherwise in the application, that's when you put it in the addendum. It always is really, really helpful to us. And please, like I said before, if you're just not sure if you um, should put something in an addendum, you can always ask me, ask Jacqueline, ask anybody in our admissions office. We can let you know if we think it's something that warrants an addendum to your application. Um, I'm gonna chime in again, Jay, if you don't mind. Yes, Another please. question that has come in about um, letters of recommendation about um, a recommendation letter from a professor, does it have value if it's from a long time ago? Um, and so we can, you know, uh, yes. I'm happy to answer. I'm happy to have you answer. Um, but, you know, I, I guess my um, my point would be that if this was a professor, you know, if you're just looking to get a professor because you feel like that would be helpful, but you went to school 15 years ago and, and there was no one that you were really close with, then I would say get letters from employers or someone else that could speak to you know your your abilities um your leadership your um you know your your strengths um but if there was a professor from 15 years back that you had a relationship with that you think could really speak um to your academic abilities and your strengths then absolutely you know i mean um i yeah. think that it, that's still important information and it still could provide for a really good um a really good recommendation that's exactly right. I would say it's 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 all dependent on the quality, right? When you're thinking about letters too. If that person is someone maybe you took, let's say 10 years ago, right? But they know you really well and you worked very closely with them in that time, it's definitely gonna be a good letter versus somebody like Jacqueline said. If, it, if you're just trying to get one for the sake of having an academic letter, it's gonna read that way, unfortunately. And sometimes recommenders, they don't do this all the time, but sometimes they will flat out say, you know what, I didn't know Jay that well. And I can't really speak to a lot of Jay's qualities because he was in a much, uh, in a really large class size and that we didn't have a lot of one-on-one -on -one contact. So it can work against you in those instances. I'm going to jump to the questions that I have from when everybody registered. Jacqueline, chime in anytime if anything's coming through the chat that we want to address. Right. Um, um, by far, the question we got the most about was scholarships. So I wanted to talk a little bit about scholarshiping. Your scholarship decision is going to come out to you alongside your admissions decision. So if you apply, for example, by our November 15th deadline, which is our next big deadline, the November 15th deadline guarantees you're going to get your decision by mid-January, usually by January 15th. When you get your admissions decision, you're going to receive your scholarship decision as well. Scholarship can come, let's say, anywhere from maybe a quarter of the tuition up to around 100% of the tuition. So anywhere really from the 25% to 100% range, right? Um, and it's determined by a huge number of factors. We're definitely looking at your academics. So we're gonna look through every piece of your transcripts, what courses you took, what grades you received, what was your major. We're gonna look at your LSAT scores. Did you take the test multiple times? Did you improve your, your scores over time? Um, we're gonna be looking at your letters of recommendation. We're gonna read through those essays very, very, very carefully, right? Every single piece together not only contributes to your admissibility, but also your opportunity for scholarship. So we will be reviewing every single applicant with an eye toward whether or not we are able to offer scholarship, and you're going to get that decision when you get your admissions decision. So if you have any additional questions about scholarship, make sure you throw those into the chat. One person asked how to get a full scholarship. I would say it's not, there's no formula to it, right? Jacqueline, like it's, it's, it yeah, is certainly I mean, not. Uh, same, there isn't a formula. I mean, we're, we're looking, you know, to reiterate the, the fact that we're really looking at um, a holistic review to applications. Um, you know, we're taking into account all pieces 
of your profile and and really, you know, um, we are we are taking into you know into consideration your prior academic success and how successful we think that you'll be in um, in in the in the law school. And so, um, but the, but there isn't like a specific um, a specific answer to that. Just really, we're looking at like really strong applicants that we think would really um, would really do well here. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I also got questions about the Keystone Scholarship. So Keystone used to be a very specific scholarship that we were offering where we don't have that anymore, but we still have the same funding available to us. So we're going to reallocate it and still be able to get that out in the form of other scholarships. I'm seeing questions about employment outcomes. So employment, at Drexel Klein School of Law. This last class, so our class of 2022 is the last class that we have data for since our 2023 class just graduated. But our 2022 class, 146 out of 158 graduates were employed in full-time long-term positions that require admission to the bar or where the JD was an advantage in obtaining and performing the job. And that's that's a 92.4% success rate in getting students jobs. We have an amazing career strategies team. The career strategies office is your boutique sort of one-stop shop who are gonna be taking care of you throughout the time that you're at the school and well after you've graduated, helping you get internships, helping you get jobs, right? I will throw this link into the chat just so that I know you have access to it. But we are required to post all of this uh, data publicly. So all of this is on our website. And you will definitely be able to see kind of what job opportunities people are getting when they graduate. Let me just throw it in here. So take a look at this page when you're able, if you're able, maybe just click on it and bookmark it for later. Um, but it gives you years worth of employment outcome data. I think that's really important to ask at every school that you're looking at, get a good look at where folks are getting jobs when they graduate. What is that percentage of folks that are getting jobs when they graduate? Um, also, you should be always looking at the bar passage rate at every school, right? Our bar passage rate tends to fluctuate in the 70 to 80% range, and we are at this moment, just waiting to hear, we, we've got about three quarters of our most recent class have received their, um, their bar results. And we're still waiting on that last couple of students that haven't gotten their bar results yet. But we should know within the next few weeks what our bar passage rate for this past year is. We have an amazing, dedicated director of bar passage at the school um, and lots of bar passage research resources for our students. So that's it's a great question to ask about both employment outcomes and bar passage. We had questions about experiential learning. I think we covered that toward the start of the call, right? Um, but if anybody who's out there joining us has any questions about the co-op or the pro bono or clinics, please feel free to toss those into the chat. We had some good questions about non-traditional applicants, and I'm not certain if those folks are on the call this evening, but I'll just briefly say that for non-traditional applicants, we're not really doing a much different review, right, than we would be for anybody who might either be a current undergrad or maybe um, just a few years out of undergrad. Non-traditional applicants, maybe they've been working in a different sector for several years before they apply to law school, or maybe who knows, right? They, they might have taken several years off. They might have started a family and been out of the workforce for some time. It's very, very individualized the way that we do admissions. We're going to be looking at each applicant very holistically, every single piece of the application. And I would say, honestly, that's a great opportunity for an addendum, right? Like if I was somebody that did, for example, start a family and maybe I was out of the workforce for a number of years and I've been out of school for some time, that's a great opportunity for an addendum. I think that's a place where if that doesn't make it into your personal statement or your optional essay, it's really helpful for us to know, you know, what you were up to in that time that you were away from either the workforce or away from school. 
Um, so most definitely, I would say, get that into the application as, in any way that you can. I see questions about the median. How can I be competitive with both my LSAT and or GPA median? Can I still be competitive if either of those or both of those are below the median? If you have questions about this, get it into the chat, please. I will just briefly say, um, if you're thinking of it this way, right? Our class, we had 146 students that came in this past year. So our median, if our median was 159, right? Then that means that roughly half of that 146 had the 159 or higher and roughly half had a 158 or lower, right? Same with the GPA, so 3.7 median, then that means roughly half had above and roughly half had below. So if that at least helps you to think through, like we're certainly not looking for every single person who's applying to have to hit both the 159 and the 3.7. We're going to look at every single component of your application. Maybe you have a stronger LSAT, but a less strong GPA. In that case, maybe you want to highlight for us in the personal statement or in the addendum if there were specific things that brought down your GPA. Maybe you were battling with an illness. Maybe you were working full time while you were in school, right? These are very, very kind of simple explanations for why a GPA might be lower and especially why, you know, you're showing, look, look how I did on my LSAT when I'm able to actually focus and spend lots of time on this specific thing, which I couldn't do on my GPA because I was working or I was taking care of a family member or whatever that case is, right? Um, and vice versa. We have a lot of students, maybe you have a really strong uh, GPA, but your LSAT is not where you want it to be. It's not quite reaching that 169 median or coming close. That's a great place for an addendum or some sort of an essay really highlighting them for them. I think the key to your entire application, you don't want there to be major holes or major gaps that you're leaving for us to fill in on our own, right? If you have the higher GPA and the lower LSAT or vice versa, and you're not explaining that to us in some way in your personal statement or in your, your essays or in an addendum, you're leaving it then to the folks in admissions to kind of fill in those uh, gaps by themselves to figure out why that might be. And I don't think that's why. I would say, help us, give us as much information as possible. I see a question about transfer credits. So for any student that is looking to transfer into the JD program, you're gonna apply for transfer admission and your transfer credits will be evaluated at that time. So it happens at the time of admission where say you're offered admission, they'll usually be able to tell you within a several days of you getting your admissions decision, how many credits transferred in. And that's very, very specific to, a, I would say a fairly small pool. We have a pretty small transfer applicant pool. Um, so anybody out there that's interested in transfer admission, let us know. We, we will definitely help you with that whole process. Um, I'll chime in that. Um... Yeah. Someone is asking about, does the age of the applicant have an impact on admission decision? And that's kind of going in line with talking about our non-traditional applicants, um, someone that, you know, worked for a number of years post undergrad. Um, and I would say it doesn't have an impact in the sense that we are that we are looking to um, to admit students of a certain age. I mean, I think that having a diverse group of students that are coming from, you know, different times in their life um, straight from undergrad and someone that's been working in the, um, you know, out in the workforce for 20 years um, only sort of brings in a more diverse class. So, um, so it doesn't have an impact in the sense that it would be, that it would be negative to, you know, to, to be a, um, an older applicant, um, but just a non-traditional, you know, just be a non-traditional applicant. We also got a great question just about mental health services at Drexel. And I wanna point out there's a really strong uh, counseling center at Drexel for all students. They do one-on-one -on -one counseling services. They do on-call crisis counseling. Um, they have a Drexel, they call it the wellness zone. That's just promoting mental health and wellness 
they do what they call BIPOC drop-ins. Counseling Center offers a space for Drexel students to identify as Black, Indigenous, and people of color to talk about whatever might be important to them. Um, I do also want to point out our Dive In program, right? And I'll throw this into the chat as well. Dive In is our diversity and inclusion initiative at Drexel Klein School of Law. This link will take you to just some more information about it, tell you about our Dean for Diversity, Inclusion, and Student Life, Dean Boardley. Um, especially if that's something that's of interest to you, we are going to be hosting a dive in webinar very soon. So we don't have the date just yet, but we're going to be getting that out to all of our prospective students. So we'll make sure that you get that date as well. But you can always email into the admissions office and just say, hey, let me know when that dive in date is selected. We also have, I love this, it's called Klein Calm. This is a space, I just threw it into the chat, um, actually that our dive-in program created for student wellness where it's in the middle of our library. You can go and you can sit in one of the beanbag chairs. It's just a place to really unwind and be able to relax, get away from the stress of school and really just kind of be away from the classroom setting, right? But it's within the law school, so you can take advantage of that as well. Um, Jay, I'm again going to chime in here yeah. with a few more questions that are popping Please, up. Sure. Um, sure. That it's um, for individual, for students that are looking for the um, optional essay prompts, um, yeah. those are available on our application. Also, if you kind of, you know, if you were interested in kind of getting a head start on some of your essays, feel free to email us. Um, but but you can find all of the um, the optional essay prompts in the application itself. Yeah, um, that's right. And, and while then we're on the call, sorry. I'll just yep. throw them in the chat. Great, perfect. Just because I have them right in front of me. Perfect. Um, and then additionally, a couple of questions about um, transcripts and um, and if you retake the LSAT. So if you retake the LSAT, we will automatically get your new score once it's released. Um, a new cast report will be sent to us. And so we will get an update that um, that you 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 know you received a new score. However, if you retake the LSAT, you receive a new score, don't wait for us to get it. Email us, letting us know that you retook the LSAT, you got a new score, um, and just so that we can kind of make note and take a look for it in your file. But we do automatically receive it. You do not need to resend it to us. Um, and then also a question about transcripts, um, that we are looking for all of your transcripts. So any institution that you've attended, even if you just took one course there, but um, but also your all of your undergraduate institutions, all of your graduate institutions, um, we we require all of those. That's right. And I just added those optional essays here to the chat. So feel free if you want to cut and paste those so you have them readily available, please do. But like Jacqueline said, you can always reach out to the admissions office and we can email them to you. No trouble. I'm looking through my list of questions. I think we brushed through everything. The student organization, I did want to share that. We did have a question about what student orgs are offered. So I'll throw the student orgs into the chat as well in case anybody wants to take a look at what those student organizations are. Um, they're very active. They're a great bunch of students. We really, I think our, our student body is just really, really special. It's something that I think a lot of us that work at the law school, it, the student body is what keeps us there. They're just, they're, they're really good students. They wanna change the world in one way or the other and they're very, very inspirational. So take a look at that list of student organizations see if there's anything there that's of interest to you. Um, yeah, another asked. question, yeah, yeah I'm just, I know ahead. that we're, no, we're running ahead. out of time here. I'm trying, yeah. to, <laughs> trying to chime in to answer what I can. Totally. Um, but also, um, if you, in terms of the um, the admissions timeline, um, mm -hmm. in terms of how long ah. before you receive a um, be, before you receive a decision, um, if you want to speak a little bit about that, Jay. Great question. And here's one of our final slides. The application okay. deadlines are up. Um, so November fifteenth. If you apply by the fifteenth, you're guaranteed a decision by January fifteenth. So if you're interested in getting a decision earlier on in the cycle, I would say aim for that November 15th deadline. It's also really helpful if you be, want to be considered for scholarship to get in as early as possible, because at 
this time, like November 15th, no one has been awarded any scholarship, right? So you will be in that first pool of applicants that is being considered for scholarship. So that's really, really important. If you wanted to apply for the two-year or the three-year summer programs, January 15th is your final deadline, but you can absolutely apply earlier, and I would recommend it where possible. Um, one caveat to these deadlines is your LSAT score. So if every item is submitted by November 15th or by January 15th, but you took the November LSAT and your score is not in yet, you will be considered having met the deadline for November 15th because we'll receive your LSAT score once that becomes available. So that's a question we get a lot about, right? Um, same goes for January. If you take that, apply for January 15th and take the January LSAT, you will still be considered complete so long as every other item is in by that deadline. We'll receive your LSAT there. Once you get your decision, if you're offered admission, we then start hosting in-person and virtual admitted student events as early as around February 1st and usually going up till at least around mid-April. So it really depends on when you're getting your admissions decision, but it's going to give you your decision, it's going to give you your scholarship decision, and it's also going to tell you what your deadline is for submitting your enrollment deposit, right? And those deadlines vary based on what time of year it is that you are receiving your decision. So if you're admitted in that early pool, usually you're going to be required to submit your enrollment deposit in and around March 1st or maybe March 15th, depending on precisely when you get that decision. So very important to take a look at those um, decision letters when they come out because they're going to give you your scholarship decision and also your enrollment deposit decision dates. I think that about wraps it up. Is there anything else in the chat, Jacqueline, that we wanted to cover? I the think last, we yeah. have answered just about everything that came in through the chat. I'm sending um, our email address in, um, I popped it into the chat now. So copy and paste that. Oh, yeah. um, and reach that out to us yeah, right yeah. here as well. And and we are, you know, I hopefully what you have gotten out of this is that we are always up for and welcoming questions and, yeah, so um, and can, you know, for you to connect with us. So at any time you're confused about something, you have questions, you want to submit some, an additional um, addendum, please reach out to us. Um, we, we really are happy to hear from you and, you know, and, and we, and we really want you to connect with us. That's exactly right. And I threw the link in for the virtual JD information session. So those virtual sessions, are one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls with current students. And sometimes like, we'll keep a small group, so it may be two or three other prospective students at the most, but those are kept intentionally very, very small. And if you and a current student, please take advantage of that. I would say at any time, check that uh, calendar and see if there's a student available, sign up for it and ask them everything. Ask them everything about the school, about the classroom, about working with faculty, about their co-op experiences, um, housing, any questions that you have that you want to know about law school, ask the students. I think they are just such an amazing and valuable resource. So we try to always get you out in front of them. So that's it for tonight. Thank you all so much. The uh, email address is there on the screen. Reach out to us, as Jacqueline said. We're really happy to talk about any of these pieces. So if there's any one that you still have lingering questions about that you want to drill down on and talk more about yourself specifically, let us know. We're happy to help. Great. Thank every, thanks everyone for joining um, and, and hopefully we connect with you all real soon. That's right. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.